Are you running a set of three? Three. You We're can ending totally at three today zero. because yeah. they're going to kick us out at three. Just equals zero. We can try to stay late. <laughs> see what it looks <laughs> like to get kicked out. <laughs> that sounds like Literally could be they'll interesting. Do, they'll peek in and be like, you need to leave. I'm oh, going to tell well, you. We can resist that. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it takes them a while to get down here, too. And to be yeah. right here. They always start at that end of the building. So we'll Have see what happens. Have you done this before? I work here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get started because we will probably be 15. We'll probably, I think maybe we'll try to do the break just for five minutes just so that we can try to get through as much as we can. Plus Keegan's not here. So like It'll be a little easier to <laughs> make it through Kanto without Keegan. Like okay, so the last thing in 10-4, I just kind of briefly mentioned it at the end of class on Thursday. Uh, the Riemann zeta function, it's a really famous function that has all sorts of uh, theorems uh, related to it, including prime number theorems, which seems very strange when you look at this function, but there's a whole bunch of prime number theorems that are related to it. There's one that has to do with the density of the prime numbers within the integers, and the Riemann zeta function helps to predict what number, how many primes there are in a certain interval. Doesn't seem like it would have anything to do with that, but it does. Riemann zeta function for positive integers, we tend to see those a lot more frequently, in particular when we have even powers on the K. The, for the even powers, you can calculate exactly what the series converges to. This one's a pretty famous one, one over K squared will converge to pi squared over six. The other part that I mentioned on Thursday that's going to be important to you is that the Riemann zeta function can be rewritten as an infinite product. So that's going to be the extra credit question on exam two. You'll have to convert this infinite sum to this infinite product. And if you look at this infinite product more carefully, this infinite product is kind of special because it's just an infinite product with prime numbers, with every prime number included. <clears throat> so this infinite product has no other integers down here except primes, and there's no primes missing. So this infinite sum can be rewritten as this infinite product. And if you look it up on YouTube, there's probably little chance that you'd be able to do it without looking up some sort of guide because it's pretty complicated when you first look at it, but you actually, all of you have the math skills to do it. Daniel? So that one also converges at pi squared over six? Yes, yeah, this is just another way to write it. So if we replace that s with a two, this is another way to write pi squared over six as an infinite product over the primes. Mm -hmm. Ben? So we like should look this up before yeah. the exam? I would, if you want those extra credit points. Well, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. And it, it'll take you practice, you know, to do it. And it, again, it's nothing that you all are capable of looking at the process and doing it and understanding it. This is a very clever way to do it. Um, but that will be your extra credit question on exam two. This is just an interesting problem in the book. Uh, it has to do with stacking dominoes. And the question is, how many dominoes does it take before you can have a, an upper domino that is completely overhanging from the original domino? Ethan? This is a Vsauce video artist. You saw that one? Yeah. Yeah. And what's the answer? I don't remember. <laughs> it's like 16. You should just watch it. It's yeah, that is a good one. So you don't have to go very far. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That seventh one is definitely overhanging the first one. And what you notice, if we start by looking at the, the, if we start accumulating the overhang, if we call this domino two units wide, then half of it would be one unit wide. And then what has to happen is that the left edge of the domino has to be on the, the center of mass for everything below it. And so it turns out that this distance here is then one half, this distance here is one third, this distance here is one fourth, this distance here is one fifth, one sixth. 
And so it turns out that the overhang amount is the harmonic series. The harmonic series diverges. So that means you can create an infinite overhang. You can make that, you can have an infinite number of dominoes that are overhanging the original one. It'd be very hard to build to find that exact center of mass and to have the proper bonding properties, but you can do it. Is this why people are so good at bouncing things? Maybe. <laughs> Thomas? I think the video said it was n to the one third. It was like the final equation. n to the one third. I'll have to look at it. I haven't looked at it in a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But you can do it. So that's the main question is can you do it? And the answer is yes. And it's actually more comp You can actually make it as far away from the original one as you want. And you don't need glue, but they have to be able to fit exactly at the center of mass and they, you know, they can't be slippery. There's got to be some bonding, some friction between them. Okay, so let's jump to the next section. And we're going to talk about the comparison and the limit comparison test here. The limit comparison test will be an extension of the ex comparison test when the comparison test doesn't quite work. But we'll first start with just the regular comparison test. So it's a very simple concept. The idea is to start with a series A sub K and we want to analyze the series A sub K. And so what we will do is choose a comparison series, which we'll always refer to as series B sub K. And the idea, if we choose series B sub K to be a convergent series, and we can show that series A sub K is smaller, and by smaller we're going to mean term by term. Okay, so that means that A sub 1 is smaller than A sub 2, A sub Excuse me. A sub 1 is smaller than B sub 1. A sub 2 is smaller than B sub 2. A sub 3 is smaller than B sub 3. So the terms in the A series are going to be smaller term by term with the series B sub K. And if that's true, if series B sub K converges and A sub K is smaller, series A sub K must converge also. If the bigger series converges, the series that's smaller, then it must also converge. Similarly, if we choose a B sub K series that diverges, and we can show that A sub K is bigger term by term, then series A sub K must also diverge. So if we have a divergent series that we pick, and the series we're analyzing is bigger than it, then it must also diverge. Pretty logical. So, for example, 1 over k squared. We know that converges. It's a convergent p series. p value is 2 and that's bigger than 1, so it converges. So that one we already have a way to decide. That converges by p series test. That's not really a test. It's a convergent p series. This one, you know is going to converge. Adding 10 in the denominator is negligible. That's not going to offset whether it converges or not. But what we have to do to prove it is to establish the relationship. So what we would like to show, and I will always write with these comparison things, I always like to show, I always like to talk about what I want to show. So I want to show that a sub k, a sub k is the series that we're analyzing, I want to show that it's less than b sub k, and I'm going to choose b sub k to be 1 over k squared. <clears throat> so you're always choosing b sub k to try to prove that a sub k is either converging or diverging. And because I want to show that this converges, all right, I know it's converging, I'm going to choose a b sub k that converges and I'm hoping to show that this is less than the convergence series that I'm picking. So let's find out. So a sub k, that's given. We're choosing this to be our b sub k, and we don't know. We don't know what the relationship is yet. And so we have to do a little bit of manipulation. We have a proportion, and we're going to do cross multiplication, whatever it takes, till you are 100% sure what direction the inequality symbol goes. That's the direction <coughs> we want it to go. 
And so we have to prove that. <clears throat> so I'm going to cross multiply here. So I'll just put a question mark. We're not 100% sure. You're pretty sure, but we want to get to a point where it is completely obvious. And 90% of the time, you can get, come down <clears throat> to a spot. I'm going to subtract k squared here. You can come down to a spot where you have two integers. And then it's obvious. So then we put in our inequality symbol. It's going to go this way. We just run it back up, and it matches. So it's doing what we want it to do. So the comparison test works here. This tells us that the series we're analyzing is smaller than a series we already know converges. So because that's true, therefore series a sub k converges by, we call this the direct comparison test, as opposed to the limit comparison test. The limit comparison test will work in a second. Yeah? How did you get from uh, the first line to the second line? Like, how did you move This to one to this one? Yeah. Cross multiplying. So I'm going to multiply both sides by k squared, multiply both sides by k squared plus 10. Okay. And that also shows that to a smaller value? It, that we, if, uh, if the series has all positive terms, we would, it would have to be true that it converges to something smaller. Because it's smaller term by term, so it's going to converge to something less. And if we look at this image here, k squared is converging to whatever, oh well, we already know, we just talked about it, that's actually a special case of the Riemann zeta function that converges to pi squared over 6. So pi squared over 6 is right here, and this one will converge to something less. Yep. Because term by term, it's smaller. <clears throat> Let's try one that diverges. So we're looking at this thing. There's our a sub k right there. a sub k is 1 over root k minus 3. And we know, quotes, we know that that's going to diverge. Uh, it's, it's like a p-series with a p-value of one-half, which is less than one. So, yeah, we have a very strong feeling that that diverges. We've already proven that this diverges. That's a divergent p-series, one over k to the one-half. k is one-half. And, of course, this negative three is negligible, but we have to prove that it diverges. So to prove that it diverges, we're going to use the, the direct comparison test. So the, the want to show, we're going to want to show that a sub k is bigger than b sub k. So b sub k is the one that we choose. And if we're trying to show divergence, we're going to choose a b sub k that diverges and if it's smaller than our a sub k, then our a sub k must diverge also. Right? If the series we're analyzing, we're always analyzing the a sub k series. And if the a sub k series is bigger than a divergent series, then it must also diverge. It's pretty logical. So let's see. So we're choosing our b sub k to be equal to 1 over the square root of k. And we want to show then that 1 over the square root of k minus 3, we want to show that that's greater than the b sub k. We don't know 100%. We just want to keep on trucking until it becomes totally obvious. Bless you. So we're just coming down until we get to a point where there is no doubt in our mind almost always, except in very rare situations, we can always get down to a couple of numbers, a couple of integers, where it's totally obvious. So we know that 0 is greater than negative 3. We just run that inequality all the way back up, and it matches what we wanted to show. So therefore, series a sub k converges by direct comparison test. Diverges. Thank you. By direct comparison test. 
So we chose a series that diverged. The series we we're analyzing was bigger than it, so it must also diverge. Super cool. All right, let's try another one. So, question. So if it turned out that it was actually smaller, yes. it just wouldn't That's tell us yes or no. Okay. Right, so the direct comparison test might fail, even though you still know it. You know, even, so let's, for example, if we look up here, if this was a minus sign, our inequality would end up going the wrong direction. And in a case like that, we use the limit comparison test. So the limit comparison test will work for those cases that you know, except that the direct comparison can't be made. So if that was a minus sign, the inequality wouldn't hold. If that was a minus sign, these fraction values would be bigger than these fraction values because the denominator would be smaller, so bigger fraction values. So a smaller series can't tell us anything about a bigger series in direct comparison, but in limit comparison it can. So if the inequality does not go the way you want it to go, then we're going to jump to the limit comparison test. How do you know which test to use? Um, you just try the two. You know, okay. you try the direct comparison, if it doesn't work, go to the limit comparison. Some people will say, well, if I know the limit comparison is going to work anyway, let's just do the limit comparison. Mm -hmm. So if the question says use the direct comparison, use the direct comparison. If it says use a comparison test, if you want to save time, you might just go right to the limit comparison test. Because anything that the direct works for, the limit also works for. Well, maybe questions on the test where like, we find out if, uh, a series diverges and then we have to compare it. So it's based on whether we got that one right. No. Okay. No, I won't do that to you. <laughs> that would be hard. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. So I'll ask you for something something like this. I'll say show that this diverges or something uh, using the direct comparison test. Or I might say show that this diverges using the limit comparison test and then you will pick the one over K. And the, and the way that you pick your b sub k, you basically erase all the fluff. So if there's constant multipliers or constants that are added, we just get rid of everything and boil it down to the simplest components and then use that one. So here, we know this is going to diverge. We erase the one. We're going to compare it to 1 over k. So what we would want to show is uh, we would want to show, which it's going to fail in this case, so if we want to show that this diverges, what we would want to show, we would want to show that this is actually bigger than b sub k, where b sub k is going to be the 1 over k. That's what we want to show, but we can't show that here, can we? Because this denominator is bigger that denominator is bigger than that denominator, so that means this fraction value is smaller. So we can't use the direct comparison here. So that's why we're going to go into the limit comparison. So this just justifies we need another test. We need a limit comparison test. So everybody follow this? So here, the series 1 over k diverges, so it's bigger. And a bigger series can't tell you anything about a smaller series. Right, a bigger series can't tell you whether a smaller series converges or diverges. Just like a smaller series can't tell you anything about a bigger series. A smaller series can't tell you whether a bigger series converges or diverges. So <clears throat> that's going to be our clue that we need to go to the limit comparison. So limit comparison is super easy also. It's not, neither, of these seri the, neither of these tests is very long. It's just another, it's just that it's another test. It's another thing to remember. So all we're going to do is take the ratio of the two and figure out what happens. And if the limit of the ratio is a finite real number, finite positive number, then both are going to do the same thing. So they both converge or they both diverge. If you had a positive well, it's going to be positive because we deal with series that have positive terms unless we're dealing with something special. So we're going to get a positive, if we get a positive real number, boom, 
they both converge, they both diverge. Now we have two special cases which are very technical. So if the limit is zero, so if you look up here, if the limit of that is zero, remember that you're analyzing the a sub k's, you're choosing the b sub k's. So we're analyzing the a sub k's, we're choosing the b sub k's. If that limit is zero, and you've chosen b sub k to be a convergent series, if this limit is zero, then the series a sub k also converges. Let's see, is that logical? If this limit is zero and b sub k converges, so if b sub k converges, that means the terms in the b sub k series are going to zero. You already know that if it's a convergent series. And if this limit is zero, that simply means that the a sub k's go to zero even faster than the b sub k's are going to zero. So if you choose a series that converges, and this limit is zero, that means the series a sub k goes, that terms are going to zero even faster, so series a sub k must converge. Now let's look at the next one. So down here, if the limit is infinity, and you've chosen a b sub k that diverges, so you've chosen a b sub k that diverges, and this limit is infinite, that means the a sub k's go to infinity even faster than the b sub k's go to infinity. So it's like if you have an exponential over a polynomial, the exponential goes to infinity faster than a polynomial. All right. A factorial goes to infinity faster than an exponential. Power tower goes to infinity faster than a factorial. So if you have that situation, if the denominator diverges, if it corresponds to a divergent series, but this limit is infinite, it means that the a sub k's grow even faster than the b sub k's, so the series a sub k must also diverge. <clears throat> okay, so those two special cases take a little bit more analysis. Most of the time we're going to be dealing with this first case. Most of the time you get a positive finite number, they both do the same thing. So let's test it, let's try it. So let's come up here to this guy. It's one that we know diverges. So we're going to take the limit as k goes to infinity, and we're going to do a sub k, so that's the one that we're given, divided by the b sub k. So if we divide by b sub k, that means multiply by the reciprocal. So that's a sub k divided by b sub k, take the limit, and what is that limit equal to? One. So that means that the series behave in a similar way. If you get a positive finite number, that means the series are linked. That means they're behaving similarly. If you get a positive finite number. And here's the notation I'm going to use to represent, to sort of say that. So one is an element. We use that Greek letter epsilon when we're dealing with sets to indicate that something is an element of a set. So one is an element. I'm going to use this symbol for the real numbers. And we want to say that it's a positive real, so I'll put a little plus up there. So that means one is an element of the positive reals. And that implies that the series that we're analyzing, series a sub k, diverges by limit comparison test. So that's what you're going to to show to conclude for a limit comparison. You somehow have to say you have to indicate that that limit value, whatever you get, is a positive real. You could say that. This is the shorthand notation. One is a positive real, therefore the series diverges by limit comparison. And then people who haven't taken Calc 2 are like, whoa, that's, that's math. That's <laughs> math. It may not look like math. Yeah, that's great. There's no numbers. <laughs> OK, so let's take a look at this one. This one's very similar to the one we just used. So this also has a plus. So you can kind of think in your head pretty easily. You know that for this one, you're going to choose your b sub k to be 1 over k. Or you just get rid of the fluff. 
You also know that that's a constant multiplier in the numerator, so you could also just factor that one out, the factor that one, factor that constant out. You know that a constant multiplier is not going to change convergence or divergence. So we're really trying to analyze that series. And you should be able to pretty easily think in your head that this denominator is bigger, so this fraction is smaller. That's not the right direction. So direct comparison won't work. So we're going to do what we did with the last one. This is very similar to the last one. So we're going to take the limit. Bless you. How'd you get the b sub k? b sub k is found by erasing the extra, the fluff. OK. And so we're going to take the limit as k goes to infinity of a sub k, which is the original. And we're forgetting the point zero, 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 0,001. We're factoring that out. So we're just looking at this as our new b sub k. So it's b sub k. Or a, a sub k divided by b sub k. Sorry, I said a sub k. I, meant, I said b sub k. I meant a sub k. So we're doing a sub k divided by b sub k. So we put our a sub k there. And then we're going to divide by b sub k. Dividing by a fraction means multiply by the reciprocal. And that limit is 1. That is an element of the positive reals. Therefore, the original series that we started with, a sub k, diverges by direct comparison, by limit comparison, limit comparison test. How do you get so good at writing those things? Practice. Sigma. <laughs> Sigma's a hard one to write. But not as hard as zeta. Zeta's a so it's a polynomial of degree 1 divided by a polynomial of degree 1. So they have equal power. So they're going to go, so the limit will be the quotient of, ratio, the quotient of leading coefficients. Oh, I see. Okay. You see it? So the other way is you could divide each term by the highest power of k. So we have k divided by k plus 4. You could divide everything by k. And then take your limit right there, and the 4 over k part's going to 0, so we get 1 over 1. Okay. Any other questions on that one? OK, this thing. Yeah, isn't the b sub k the same as a when you? Say that again? This is the one where I had more of a question how to find b sub k. This one here? Yeah. OK. so. What, we can't break this apart because the difference is in the denominator, so we can't split it. But we do know that the series 1 over 3 to the k, what do we know about this series? It's geometric. Geometric. And it converges. Yep, this is a convergent geometric series. So we know that that converges. <coughs> We also know that we are shrinking the denominator by subtracting off this 2 to the k. We're shrinking the denominator, which means we're making the fraction values bigger when we subtract off that 2 to the k. So the question then becomes, are we subtracting off so much that we are offsetting this convergence and then creating divergence. That's the question in our head. We know that if it was just 1 over 3 to the k, that we would have a convergent geometric series because r is less than 1. So this is because r is less than 1. So subtracting off in the denominator is increasing the fraction values, which means you might have divergence, but we've, we kind of know that, we kind of suspect that 3 to the k dominates 2 to the k. 3 to the k grows faster than 2 to the k. So our hunch should be that it probably converges. So let's try. So if we wanted to use a direct comparison, 
could we use a direct comparison? If we wanted to use a direct comparison, we would need to show that a sub k is less than the b sub k. But this is not less than b sub k. We just set, went through the whole logic that, oh, if we're shrinking the denominator, we're growing the fraction. So this is bigger than this. This converges, so a convergence series can't tell us anything about a bigger series. So direct comparison doesn't work, so we go with limit comparison. So let's try limit comparison. So we're going to do the limit, a sub k over b sub k, as k goes to infinity. <coughs> so limit a sub k, that's the original. That's what we're analyzing. We divide by b sub k, which means that we're going to have to do some flipping here. So we're choosing our b sub k to be 1 over 3 to the k, or you know these are equal, or if you wanted to write it in the geometric series notation, you'd write it that way, 1 third to the k. It's easier to flip this one, though. So we're going to divide by that, so we're going to multiply by 3 to the k, um, divided by 1. So if they were being added, which one would you have chosen? Or? So if they were being added, direct comparison would work. Okay. Right? If they were being added, then this denominator would be bigger, which means the fraction values would be smaller. So then our a sub k would be smaller than b sub k, and we chose a b sub k that converged, so then this would converge by direct comparison. If it was a plus. Sweet. So if you're dealing with convergence, a plus works and a minus doesn't. And if you're dealing with divergence, then it's the opposite. Because you want the, yeah, it's the opposite. OK, so what's this limit then? How do we find that limit? Huh. What do you think we should divide every single term by? Three to the k. Three to the k. That's the dominant term. So we're going to divide every term by 3 to the k. Look at that. 2 to the k divided by 3 to the k. We can mush that together into 2 thirds to the k. And what happens to 2 thirds to the k as k goes to infinity? That goes to? 2 thirds to the k as k goes to infinity? Zero, right? We have a number that's less than one being multiplied by itself. Two thirds times two thirds is four ninths. Times two thirds, it just keeps getting tinier and tinier, closer to zero, so that's going to zero. So this limit is equal to one, which is an element of the positive real numbers, which implies the original series converges by limit comparison test. Why isn't there a symbol for converge or diverge? I know, <laughs> right? That's a good point. Hmm. You could make one. Mm -hmm. Would it be bad style to use the empty set symbol for divergence? Mm, probably. Because the empty set is the set that contains nothing. That's saying something different about whether you're dealing with convergence and divergence. Empty set would be a little different. Empty set. Converge. Goes down to it. <laughs> nice little swirlies. Swirlies down mean converge, swirlies up mean diverge. Well, it's kind of like that symbol that we use for the growth chart when we talk about the factorial function. We use the double greater thans for the, you know, if we do something like that. Yeah, so maybe we use triple. Yeah. Okay, so how about this one? What's our gut? Instinct. Everybody think to themselves whether this series converges or diverges. So get it in your mind. Now, 
Raise your hand if you think it diverges. Don't look at your neighbors. One, why would you think diverge? What's two, two Daniels? So what would be a clue or what are you looking at to think that maybe it diverges? One over square root, k plus two diverges. So one over square root definitely diverges. And that's what you're focusing on. So what about this? What if I said, let's peel off the, the extraneous stuff? If we peel off the extraneous stuff, we'd be left with this. And what would the exponent on k be if we combine those two factors? 3 over 2. So what about that series? Series 1 over k to the 3 halves. What do you think? Converge. Converges because it's now a p-series. It's now a p-series with p equal 3 halves. So this right here generates a series. That's a convergent p-series because p equals 3 halves, which is greater than 1. So what do we think about the original series? Converges then. So we're, we're assuming that this plus 2 is negligible. That plus 2, there's no way it's going to offset what this is doing. And that's a convergent p-series. So the first question is, does this directly compare or not? So we have to think to ourselves that this denominator is bigger than that denominator. So this denominator is bigger because we added 2 inside the root, which means these fractions are smaller than those fractions. So can we use direct comparison test if the a sub k's are smaller than the b sub k's and the b sub k's converge? What do you think? We're still kind of confused. Why is it 3 halves? So we're thinking of this as k to the 1 times k to the half, so then we're adding our exponents. So we're using rules of exponents. Bless you. <clears throat> so direct comparison will work here. So we want to show, we want to show that the a sub k's are less than the b sub k's. We've chosen a series that converges, and if the series we're analyzing has smaller terms, it must also converge. If we have a series b sub k that converges and our a sub k's are even smaller, must also converge. So let's check. So our a sub k is the original. And we don't know what's happening yet. We're pretty darn sure though, we've, unless we've goofed k to the 3 halves. <coughs> so we cross multiply k to the 3 halves, question mark, get to that point. And maybe I'm going to write this k to the 3 halves as k root k. It's a little simpler to think about what the next step is. The next step, divide out the k. Yeah, and now it's starting to reveal itself. Square both sides. Subtract the k. So we should always be able to get down to some integers that we know the relationship for. So we just run our greater than back up, and it matches. And because it matches, therefore, the original series, a sub k, converges by direct comparison test. Does it matter what constant you put in? Uh, say that again, which constant where? So the plus 1 instead of plus 2, does that matter? Oh, why did I put a plus 1 there? Hmm, good question. It which does, I mean, it's... I'm not uh, sure if you're allowed to do that. No, 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 that, that's supposed to be a 2, sorry. Thank you for noticing. We should have a 2 there. Okay. I wasn't sure if that you saw that it was a constant, so you just plugged it in. I, I don't know what number. I saw there. We okay. should leave it exactly. The a sub k should be exactly what we have there. Okay. Yeah. 
Good eyes. I always do some weird things and I'm like, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I always do some weird things. You should see what you do. <laughs> that last test, I was like, man, you do some weird things. Just call me out. <laughs> <laughs> we all do weird things. That's we don't see. <laughs> okay, so how about this one? What's our hunch? If you think it converges, raise your hand. Hands going up. Where's your hand? I have no idea. You have no idea where your hand is? So sounds like a problem. This, yeah, <laughs> sounds like a scary problem. Okay, so what about if we had just this? Converge or diverge? Converge. Converge. P series. What's P equal to in that case? Two, and it's bigger than one, so that would be convergent. So our question in our head then is, okay, if that part converges, we can imagine this as k squared times natural log squared. Doesn't natural log also go to infinity? So k squared's in the denominator going to infinity, and then we're multiplying it by something else that's also going to infinity, so that denominator is going to infinity even faster than if it was just k squared. So our hunch is that this will still converge. That's our hunch. Um, so natural log of k also goes to infinity. And I, I said something that maybe is not 100% true. So k squared goes to infinity. If you multiply it by natural log of k quantity squared, I said that that goes to infinity faster. That's not necessarily true. We, that would take a little bit of looking into. Um, it might be true, but it still goes to infinity. And the question would be more, does it go to infinity slower than the k squared, that it could possibly slow it down so that this diverges? No way. So our hunch should be that it converges. But to say what I said, that k squared times natural log of k squared goes to infinity faster than just k squared, that I'd have to look at more carefully just to make sure. OK. So our hunch, though, is that multiplying by natural log of k will not mess this up. So can we do a direct comparison? So we're choosing a series that converges. So can we show? So we want to show that our a sub k's are less than the b sub k's. So that's what we want to show if we were going to be able to use a direct comparison. So we take our exact a sub k, and I'm going to break that apart into that, and compare it to b sub k. We want to know whether that's true or not. <clears throat> so pretty straightforward. We're going to multiply to a quick cross multiplication, then we're going to divide out the k squareds. So we have one question mark natural log of k squared. <coughs> we're dealing with all positive numbers, so we can take the square root of both sides. I was going to say, couldn't you have done that from the very beginning? Yeah. Yep. You can take the square root right in the beginning and then cross multiply or cross multiply and square root. Doesn't matter. OK, so what direction does the inequality go? Natural log of k goes to infinity. Where do the k's start here? k start at 2. Is natural log of 2 bigger than 1? And it doesn't re what is natural log of 2? 1 point something. And it doesn't really matter if we're dealing with a finite number of terms that didn't satisfy that. What's most important is that eventually it's definitely true. As k goes to infinity, it's definitely true. It may only be true when k is 3 or more. What is natural log of 2? 0.7. And what's natural log of 3? Well, 1.09. So this is true for k greater than or equal to 3. 
So in math, what we say a lot of times is that this is eventually true, which is enough. Just like a series that converges, if you chop off the first three terms, it doesn't matter, it still converges. Same with the sequence. Why wouldn't you say k is greater than e? Uh, well, k is an integer, so it would be the same thing. k is an integer, so uh, because it's the counter here, so we could say k greater than e, but either way, it's the same, same set of integers. Okay. So either way. And that's a good point. My question was kind of dumb because we could have exponentiated this and then k related to e, right? We could have gone one more step, exponentiated, and had that. And so then we know that k is bigger as soon as we hit 3. Yeah. Man, 10 to head of a lot of expo or exponential things. Say again? Homework, 10 to had a lot of exponentials. Exponent, lots of exponentials. I agree. Exponentials are important. So what's our conclusion then? So we run our inequality back up. We know that k is bigger than e eventually. So we just run it back up. And did it go the right direction? Yes. So if it goes the right direction, therefore, the original series, a sub k, converges by direct comparison. Did not have to go to the limit comparison. So as long as it's eventually true, mm -hmm. you can say that it's yeah. true. But it's not true just for the first term, it doesn't matter. But it's eventually like it's the true. first five terms. It doesn't matter. Okay. First finite number of terms, doesn't matter. <clears throat> yeah, Daniel. So that works really just fine with the direct comparison test. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to this horrible thing. Huh. So this is just a summary table on when you're looking at your tests. And um, let, let, we won't go through this in great detail, but let's just make sure we kind of know where we're at right now. So we should at least, if we don't formally do it, we should at least, when we see an infinite series, think about the divergence test. Think about a sub k's limit. The only way you get convergence is if that limit is zero. And if that limit is not zero, you know right away it diverges. So that's the first thing you, show, you analyze. You sort of think in your mind, OK, the limit's zero. Oh, it's not zero. Then it diverges. So that's something that you should always think about first. And then we've got the special series that we've looked at extensively, the geometric series and the p-series. So we've looked at those a lot. And then we've got our telescoping series. And uh, this table, when we came, the new edition that we got, the edition three, one thing that they did was they put this table, uh, they had the, there's two tests that we're about to do called the ratio and the root test, two tests. And uh, they, put this t they put those in a previous section, and so those are included here and the alternating series. So we have not done alternating series, the root test or the ratio test. So we haven't got to this part yet. So this part we're about to do next. And then we're about to do the root test next, and we're about to do the ratio test next. So at this point, we've got our divergence test, then we've got our special series, and then we have the integral test. If we have an integrand, an a sub k, or a sum and, if we have a sum and that looks like it would be a good integrand, if it looks like we could integrate it, we could use the integral test. We're going to get to this one in a minute. Or actually, we'll get to that next, next class. And then down here, we've got those extra um, tests that we just looked at, the, the limit test, limit comparison test, and the comparison test. So we just sort of have to try to keep these things organized in our head. Divergence test first special series, which include geometric and P in particular. And then we've done the telescoping. Telescoping is usually obvious, because you've got a term that's got a subtraction in it, so it's usually pretty obvious. Um, so let's continue forward. All right, so this thing, this series, 
we have to decide we don't have it written as a closed form. We have it written as an expanded series, so we don't know yet. Is that, maybe it's a geometric series, maybe it's not. All of our tests involve an A sub K that's written in a closed form. So let's see if we can do that. Can we write this in a closed form really easily? Can we start with K equals one and make that work? Could start with K equals two, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Maybe we should start with K equals two, because um, that doesn't matter. Obviously you can do like N over N plus one. Yeah, let's try that. So K over K plus one raised to the K, K plus, plus one. one. Is that right? Let's check. <coughs> Plug in K equals one, we get a half to the two. Plug in K equals two, we get two thirds. Yeah, that works. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. So there is our series, closed form, A sub K. So now we have to decide whether it converges or not. <laughs> this has the, the indeterminate limit. So we can't just look at this and say that it might converge because we don't know that the limit of this is zero. Right? We have one to the infinity. That's an indeterminate form. One to the infinity. So to take that limit, Let's take the limit as k goes to infinity of that. How do we do it? Have to do logs. Yes, we have to do logs. Yes, 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 yes. So we're going to say, let's let that be y. Limit as k goes to infinity, so we'll just call it y, and then we're going to take the natural log of both sides, call that function y. We'll imagine that that k is really an x, and we can differentiate. So I'm going to switch sides, and I'm going to put the limit of natural log, so we'll take the natural log of both sides. So we're going to take the natural log of the other side, and that's going to bring down the k plus 1 in front. limit should be in front of that. So it should be limit, k goes to infinity of k plus 1, natural log of k divided by k plus 1. So we take the natural log of both sides and then we pop down the exponent. We're not quite there yet. What do we have to do here? Typical thing that we do is move this into the denominator so that we have a fraction value there where the top is going to zero and the bottom is going to zero. So now we can use L'Hopital's rule. You have to get it in an indeterminate form. So we can use L'Hopital's rule. Oh, I tried to use log properties and split it up into like. You can use log properties, but then you're going to still have to still be in the same. That's why I looked up. I got lost. Got lost. So a derivative of the numerator, we flip it. So the derivative of the, a log is 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of that inside is low times d high. d high is 1, low d high, minus high d low is also 1 over low squared. Over no, no. And then in the denominator, low d high is 0 minus high d low over low squared. Did we get that? Bunch of cancellation. That goes away with that. That goes away with that. And so can we see our limit? So over here, we're left with just 1. So really, all we have left is a negative 1 in front of this. So what does that limit equal to? Can you see it? What did you say, Daniel? Negative 1. That'll be our limit. 
plus 1 over k goes to 1, and then we have the minus in the denominator that pops up. So therefore, we're almost to, the, to a conclusion. So therefore, the limit of y as k goes to infinity, so the limit of what we called the original thing, the limit of that no. we found by exponentiating. So we get e to the negative 1, which is 1 over e. This is not equal to 0. So that implies that our original series diverges by the divergence test. So if the limit of a sub k is not 0, divergence instantaneously. <laughs> Ready for a break? Can you say what you said again if it is not What does it go to zero? So if the limit of a sub k is not zero, then it's instantaneous conclusion that it diverges. Because we know for an infinite series to converge, you've got to be adding terms that are going to zero, otherwise it would diverge. All right, let's go ahead and take a break. Let's just take five. It's I think, I think. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up some stuff here. So, okay, so we're going to choose our test. What do we think about this one? Do we think that this one, do we have a sense? Converge or diverge? Oh, this is stretching. Um, you raise your hand. Do you think it converges or diverges? Um, I think it. Um, I think I'm confused. <laughs> so, what about limit of a sub k? Is limit of a sub k zero? Um, no. Uh -huh. No. Is it? So, if we look inside that set of parentheses, doesn't the inside go to one half? Oh, yeah, it does. The inside oh, goes to one half. And what about uh, one, no. one half to the k? Is that converge or diverge? One half to the k. Converges. Converges why? Because it goes to geometric series. Geometric series, one half to the k. So ratio less than one is convergent if we have r to the k. So it, my hunch would be that it converges because looks like the inside goes to a half and half to the k is like a geometric series. So, okay. Now the test that we're going to use, again I mentioned that the new edition moved a couple of things. The test that we're going to use for this one is called the root test. And we're going to do this in the next section, so I'm not going to cover this right now. I was going to ask if we could go over the other things and then come back to like figuring out which tests. What's so that? this is going to be the root test. We'll see that the root test works well if you just have a power on the outside. You'll be able to take the root of it. So, but our hunch is that this is going to converge. So if we wanted to use a test that we have, some of our choices would be Probably the limit, we could, might be able, we could try the limit comparison test and use one half to the k. Um, can we take, let me just think in my head real quick, if we took the limit of that, we took that, we divided it by one half to the k. Actually, I think we, I think we can. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try limit comparison. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k over b sub k, I think it'll work. This k goes to infinity. What we'll see is that the root test works really easily if you have a parenthetical quantity raised to the k. It's going to be really easy with the root test. But I think this might work. Let's try it. So a sub k, we put our a sub k here. And we're going to choose our b sub k, our b sub k, we're thinking of it as one half to the k. 
which is convergent geometric series. So we're dividing by that, so we're multiplying by 2 to the k. <coughs> Question? Yeah, so I know we're supposed to just get rid of the stuff mm -hmm. to the side, you know, one half to the k. Yep. But it's kind of like not defined, so like how much stuff, like... Um, well, if we look inside, it's the one that's superfluous. So that goes away, and if that goes away, then the k squares cancel. Right, so if we take away that one right there, as soon as this guy's gone, then the k squareds cancel, and we have one half to the k. So it's basically taking away anything that's added or subtracted. That's the main thing. Can we take this limit then? So these things have the same power, so we can pull the two in. So this is going to be the limit of 2k squared over 2k squared plus 1 to the k. And that limit as k goes to, inf oh, now it becomes indeterminate. Ugh. Because now the limit in here becomes 1 to the infinity, which is indeterminate. We tried. Can we come back to this one after we learn our test? So, so that doesn't work. So we'll use the root test. We can't do what we did last time. Or we, raise it to the, or we, we could do that. I don't want to go through that whole process. We could, so that's indeterminate. So we could use the log of that and go through that whole process. But I don't want to do that. We don't have enough time for that. But we could. It's just going to be much easier with the root test. I don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. We have other stuff. We have other stuff. Okay, how about this guy? What do we think? <clears throat> converge or diverge? Converge. So if we were going to peel off stuff and think about creating a b sub k, we'd peel off the minus 1, and then we'd have 2 over e to the k. And does 2 over e to the k, if that were, Converges. is that a converge or diverge? Is it, is it a geometric? It's a geometric, and this would be the ratio, and that ratio is less than 1, right? 2 over 2.7, mm -hmm. less than 1. So our hunch is that this is going to converge. Can we do a direct comparison? Let's think. So we've got this as a convergent, so we would need this to be smaller if we're going to do a direct comparison. If this converges, we need this to be smaller if that's going to converge. Is this smaller? Well, if we decrease the denominator, we increase the fraction, so direct comparison won't work. So we use limit comparison. So limit comparison. So we'll take the limit as k goes to infinity of a sub k. So exactly what we're analyzing. <coughs> Divided by b sub k, which means multiplied by the reciprocal the 2 to the k's cancel. So this will be the limit of e to the k over e to the k minus 1. We divide everything through by e to the k. And that limit, as e to the k goes to infinity, that fraction goes to 0, so this limit is 1. And now we have to remember, how does the limit comparison test conclude? If the limit of a sub k over b sub k is a positive real, then we have convergence by the limit comparison test. So then our original series converges by limit comparison test. Since we chose a convergent series. This is a convergent geometric series. So we chose a convergent series. We did a limit, got a positive real, 
That means both series do the same thing. So that means our original series converges. Good? 3 to the k over e to the k minus 1 with that converge. Yes. So as soon as this <coughs> bumps above 2.7, then we're going to have divergence. So if that was 3 to the k, we'd have divergence. Because 3 over e would be bigger than 1. Yes. Truth. Truth. OK, this is another one that we're going to just wait and use the, um, use the root test. So we'll do that one later. Root test will be make that one very easy. This guy, actually we already did this one. We did 1 over k squared times natural log of k squared. Wasn't there also a k squared on the top, I feel like? Yeah. We may have done that one also. We did a ton. Oh, yeah, there was We've done a lot. Squared. So this one we could uh, do, let's, can we do direct comparison on this one? Sure. So this is a sub k. Our hunch is that it converges. 1 over k squared, that goes to 0 fast. So we know that converges. Throwing in a natural log, we think, yeah, it's not going to change much. So what we would want is to show that it's smaller than a comparison. This is what we want to show. That's what we would want to show, that a sub k is less than b sub k. Is it true? Well, we can cancel out and cross multiply, and we would get this. And let's put a question mark there, because I don't, well, no, I want to show that. Usually I just use the a sub k and b sub k, but that's what we want to show. So here we don't know yet. We cross multiply, cancel out the k's. Yeah, that's true, right? Eventually, when k, if we exponentiate, we get e and we get k. And when k is 3, that is true. So this is true eventually. <clears throat> so that means that we can run back up. That's true. So that's the direction that we have. So that implies that the original series is going to converge by direct comparison. And that true eventually just means that as soon as k hits 3, we're good. That will be true. <clears throat> Comparison, direct comparison. All right, any questions on comparison or, oh wait, there's one more there. I didn't see that there. Any, this is another one that's gonna be really easy with the root test. One thing that we could do here is just rewrite it and then think to ourselves, could we use a limit comparison test or a direct comparison? We have 1 over k to the k. What's your hunch on that one? It goes to 0. A sub k goes to 0 for sure, so then it might converge. And the question is, does the a sub k go to 0 fast enough to yes, make convergence? k to the k grows faster than any of the other functions we've seen. So these terms are going to go to 0 faster than anything we've seen. So yeah, that's going to converge. And it's super easy to show with the root test. So we'll do that one also next week or next time. Root test. Super easy to do with the root test. And we can make a for it. Yeah, the root test is pretty cool. OK, so let's take a look at the alternating series test. The alternating series test is going to be used for analyzing alternating series. And I'm telling you, this is the easiest of all the tests in a lot of ways because you know when to use it when the series is alternating. And it's only got two small steps. 
So that's actually going to be a pretty, uh, it's going to be a pretty automatic process. So the first alternating series we're going to look at is the alternating harmonic. So the alternating harmonic, we have one. Notice the switch up here is going to be for even power, for even, for the even indices, we will have a positive. So the first term is going to be positive. Hmm, I might not have said that right. It's going to look like this. This is the alternating harmonic. So when k is 1, so when k is, when, the, when we're dealing with the odd terms, if that's the first term and that's the third term, the odd terms will be positive. So the question is, does it converge or diverge? The answer is it actually converges. We know that if it was all positives, it would diverge. That's the harmonic. Diverges by integral test. This is going to converge, and it converges to the nice, simple number, natural log of 2. We'll converge to that. So if you throw in minuses every other term, it will converge. So here's what the partial sums look like. So the partial sums, the first s sub 1 is just the first term. s sub 2 is the sum of the first two terms. s sub 3 is the sum of the first three. So we get this sequence, 1 comma 1 half comma 5 over 6 comma 7 over 12. So we get those. And that's what it looks like. So S sub 1 is up there, S sub 2, S sub 3, S sub 4, S sub 5. So it's bouncing around this number here, which is natural log of 2. So an alternating series, if it converges, it's going to have that oscillating pattern to its sequence of partial sums. The sequence of partial sums will zoom, will, will zoom in on some number. So that's what a convergent alternating series will look like. There's S sub 1, there's S sub 2, there's S sub 3. <coughs> Pretty cool. Now, our simple test. So first off, they say, remember the divergence test. It doesn't matter if there's alternating signs or not. The limit of a sub k still must be 0 to have any chance for convergence. Still, we know that. So here's the alternating series test. I usually do it in the other order. I call this one, call that 2. Why? Because we do this anyway. When you first look at a series, you say it, at least in your head, do the terms go to zero. So if you're going to do it anyway, you might as well do that. And this step's harder, so you might as well do that one first, because if this limit's not zero, you know it diverges if the limit of a sub k is not zero. So it makes much more sense to do that first. OK. So here are the two things for the alternating series test. The terms still have to converge to zero, nothing new. And the only other condition is that the sequence of terms, and I'm going to write it this direction. The sequence of terms, when we deal with an alternating series, we are going to treat the sign different from the a sub k. So this is the first time we've done this. So for an alternating series, we're going to assume that the a sub k part is positive. And then we're going to force the sign with this switch, with the negative 1 to the k plus 1. So we're going to analyze a sub k is really the magnitude of what's here. It's like the absolute value of it. So we're going to think of the a sub k as positive, and then the sign is separate. So here are the only two conditions. The limit of a sub k is 0, and the sequence is non-increasing. Now, if you combine the two, 
you sort of think this way. And let me, let me rewrite this as another practical idea. Non-increasing means that it stays the same or goes down 99.5% of the time when we're talking about non-increasing, we really mean decreasing. We really mean decreasing. It's so hard to build a truly non-increasing sequence where it stays the same and then drops, stays the same and then drops. For us, it's going to decrease. So if we combine these two ideas, right there and right there, all we're saying is that if you have an alternating series, if you ignore the minuses, if you have a sequence of terms that decreases to zero, automatic convergence. So if you forget about the minuses, you're just looking at the a sub k's, if they decrease to zero, that's enough. So if we go back up and look at that alternating harmonic, the sequence of positive values, the sequence of absolute values, if you want to think of it that way. So for an alternating series, again, we think of the minus 1 to the k plus 1 as separate. So the a sub k's for an alternating are really the 1, the 1 third, the 1 half, the 1 third, the 1 fourth, the 1 fifth. So the term values, other than the minuses, decrease to 0. That's it. Then it converges automatically. That's it. So super non-complicated. If the terms decrease to zero, convergence. So here, let's try one. So let's just make sure it's clear what a sub k is. a sub k is 1 over the square root of k. So we think of, with the alternating series, we think of the a sub k's as separate from the minuses. So that's the a sub k. So here is our alternating series test. One. We take the limit of a sub k. That's zero. We're halfway there. Now, we want to show that this sequence of terms is decreasing. So we want to show that the terms get smaller. So if we can show that the terms get smaller, that's enough. So I'm taking away the greater than or equal to, because we're, it's going to be decreasing. We're not going to be able to construct a sequence that truly is non-decreasing, non-increasing. So we want to show that it's decreasing. So we want to show that the subsequent term is smaller than the prior term. That's just a little bit of algebra. So we want to show that. So there's a sub k. A sub k plus 1, we just put a plus 1 into the square root. We don't know the direction of this yet. If we use a little intuition, we know that the denominator on the right is bigger, so that's smaller, so it's going to match. But we do just a little bit of algebra. We cross multiply. We want to get to a point where it's just obvious to a fifth grader. Square both sides, subtract the k. So if we can get down to a nice simple pair of numbers, then we put our inequality symbol, we run it back up, check to see if it's what we wanted. It is. So therefore, uh, convergent by alternating series test. So alternating series test. Limit is zero, and the terms decrease. So if we wanted to encapsulate that in one statement, if the terms decrease to zero, automatic convergence. How could the limit be zero and the terms not decrease? Uh, you could have, so, so if you have an alternating series, your question is if the limit is zero, um, you could have, if the limit is zero, I agree, that would be super hard to construct. I can't think of a good example. But if you think about creating 
a decreasing, you could easily create a decreasing sequence that doesn't converge to zero. Right. Um, I don't see why they didn't just put the limit thing first and then stop there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let me think about also, it. Also, there's got to be a counterexample. If you have, I just can't think of one. If you have a series that like that had like a bump at the beginning and then went to zero, mm -hmm. that should still converge. Yes, but it's not decreasing. So what they say <coughs> is that it's so. I didn't really emphasize this because we don't see the bumps usually, but it's eventually. Oh, that's what that meant. Yeah. So I, that part threw me off because there's no end in it. Yeah, so the idea is that maybe you have to go out 10 terms, but then it decreases. Okay. So there could be some bumps in the road, and then capital N is representing that threshold where the series starts to behave properly. So the tail. The tail. Yeah, so n is just sort of the first finite number of terms are getting ignored. And so capital N is representing that threshold beyond which the terms decrease to zero. Okay. But so that it gets rid of any bumps in the front. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so let's take a look at this alternating series. So we, the first thing is that you need a way to identify whether it's alternating or not. It should be jumping right at you because you see that switch. So we've got the switch staring us in the face. So we know it's an alternating series. So we know we use the alternating series test. So we're going to take the limit of a sub k. And again, for an alternating series, a sub k is everything except the switch. So that's a sub k. And that limit, 99% of the time, is just done by inspection. The limit has a constant in the numerator and a denominator that's growing to infinity, so the limit has to be 0. So done, step one. Now we want to show that it's decreasing. So we want to show it's decreasing, so we want to show that as we go further out, the terms are getting smaller. So as we go out, the terms are getting smaller. So our a sub k is 1 over k, natural log squared of k. We want to compare that to 1 over k plus 1, natural log squared of k plus 1. And we don't know what the direction is, <clears throat> cross multiply. So if we cross multiply, we get k plus 1, natural log squared of k plus 1, question mark k times natural log of k squared. Okay, so what do y'all think here? There's a couple of ways we could proceed, and um, I almost want to back up because the way we don't have anything that we can divide out. All the other ones we've seen, you can divide out something. We can't divide anything out here, but what we could do to sort of pair off the natural logs on one side and pair off the k plus 1 and the k on the other side. That might be a better way to sort of analyze it. You could make this argument. You could make this argument that k plus 1 is bigger than k, and natural log of k plus 1 is bigger than natural log of k. Right, you could make that argument, and that's true. But I'm thinking it might be cleaner if we do this. What if we pair off the natural logs on the uh, left side and the non-natural logs on the other? So what if we do this? So if we do natural log squared of k plus 1 divided by natural log squared of k, and then move the k over here, do that. 
And then on the left side, we can put the square on the outside. So we have something like this, and then k over k plus 1. <clears throat> OK. So can we analyze here? If we look to this side, is this side always greater than 1 or less than 1? Denominator is bigger, so less than 1. So that right-hand side is definitely a fraction when we think of fraction. How about this side? What's true about this side? Natural log of k plus 1 is bigger than natural log of k because the natural log function is a growing function. It's increasing. Natural log looks like that. So if you pick a place where k is, and then you look at k plus 1, natural log of k plus 1 is going to be bigger than natural log of k. Everyone agree with that? So this inequality then must go that direction. This number is less than 1. This number is bigger than 1. And so then we back it up, and we get the direction we want. So that checks out. So therefore, converge by alternating series test. <clears throat> Number 26. So alternating series, obvious, because there's a switch. So we go to the alternating series test. So the first step, step one, let's take the limit as k goes to infinity of k factorial over k to the k. Doesn't the bottom grow way faster than the top? So, so here, we don't have a real solid mathematical way to do this because we have a factorial. We don't know how to differentiate that. k to the k, we could differentiate using log properties. Uh, but what we do here is just go to the growth table. So we use the growth relationship. So here is just is more of an intuitive thing. This is equal to zero because k to the k grows much faster than k factorial. So we can write that on. Yes, for all the other limits, we know how to differentiate exponentials. We know how to differentiate logs. We know how to differentiate polynomials. These two are the two we don't know how to differentiate. So for those two, if we have to take a limit, we use the growth table, the growth chart thing, growth table. <clears throat> and then to show that it's decreasing, so we want to show that the terms get smaller as we progress through the sequence. So we want to show a sub k, we want to show that it is greater than what happens when we plug in a 1, uh, k plus 1. So we want to show this. So this looks very similar to the last one that maybe Pure cross multiplication isn't the answer. Let's put the k, the exponent of k on one side and the factorials on the other. So let's pair it off like this. Let's uh, divide both sides by k plus 1 factorial. And let's put a k to the k up here. So let's look at it that way. Let's see, can we simplify that? Well, over here on the left, we have k factorial. k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 times k factorial. k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 multiplied by k, multiplied by k minus 1. So we can peel off that front factor, and then these will cancel. Over here, we could do a little manipulation. We could make this, in the denominator, we could make this k plus 1 multiplied by k plus 1 to the k. 
so that these could then be combined. <clears throat> and let's see where that takes us. So we're going to have cancellation also here, the k plus 1 in the denominator, k plus 1 in the denominator. Those guys will cancel. So on the left side, we now are down to 1. Left side, there's nothing left. And over here, we have k divided by k plus 1, all raised to the k power. Which, is it a greater than or a less than? Pointing which way? One is greater. One is greater. All right, this right here is a true fraction. K is smaller than K plus 1, so that's a fraction. And if you raise it to a power, that gets even smaller. So then we run it back up and hope that it goes the direction we wanted, and it does. So therefore, convergence by alternating series test. So that's about as hard as it gets with the alternating series. When you have factorials and power towers, that is as hard as it gets, that one. Yeah? OK. Do they close school? Yeah, early. They don't have the stuff going on. No problem. This would be a bad day. OK, so. Let's, yeah, Daniel. So if you have the k plus 1 factorial, then you can just multiply that by k factorial. It's Does it make sense? Yeah, it's big. So if we think about, the next, right, it's the, the next less integer. So if we have something like 6 factorial, we can think of that as 6 times 5 factorial. And so it's a little more abstract when you're dealing with the k, but it's that same idea. Okay, let's take a look at this crazy looking thing. So the remainder in an alternating series. This is super interesting and it's very visual. So when we're thinking about a series that converges, we think about S as the sum of the series and we think about S sub n as the nth partial sum. So that S sub n is representing the sum of the first n terms. Right. So when we're analyzing a series, we think about the sum of the series. We can break it into the sum of the first n terms plus whatever's left. And that's what the remainder is. So if we have an infinite series, we can think of it as S sub 10 plus r sub 10. r sub 10 would be the sum from the 11th term on. So s sub n is the sum of the first n terms. r sub n is the tail. Okay, so the total sum looks like this. can be broken apart. And the idea is that we want to minimize the r sub n. So we want to go far enough out in the series that we have convergence that's really close to the actual answer. And so we want to minimize the r sub n. So the idea is to get a, a read on what the remainder is. And with an alternating series, it's fascinating. The remainder is less than the magnitude of the next term. What do I mean by that? So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at a picture here. So we saw that the partial sums if we're dealing with a convergent alternating series, the partial sums bounce around that limit value, what the series is going to add up to. And so notice this. So there's S sub n. S sub n plus 1, we've got, it's, we know it's going to converge. That's going to be S. When we add the next term, we go to the other side because it's an alternating series. So we've added. We add this as a plus. The plus term took us up to here. Then we subtract and we get down to here. Yeah. Now, what they did was just track the S of n over here so that we can get a sense of this difference. So 
that difference, the s sub n plus 1 minus s sub n, that is this term right here, right? It's that term that takes us from here to there. So this difference right there takes us all the way down. Like if we were to go back and look at uh, the alternating harmonic, so we're, let's put one way up here. No, no, I need, let's do this. So let's call that one. So the alternating harmonic starts at one, and then we uh, subtract at two, we're going to subtract off one half, so we're going to be at one half. And the alternating harmonic is converging to natural log of two. And it keeps getting closer. But when we go from this term down to this term, that difference, right, that is a sub two in this case. a sub two takes us from s sub one to s sub two. So we're adding a sub 2 to get down there. So we've gone through the actual sum of the series all the way down. And that distance is bigger than the distance from s sub n to the actual sum. Right? a sub n plus 1 moves us through the sum and down. So that absolute value distance right there, that distance is bigger than this, right? Isn't that yellow line representing the r sub n? Right. If s sub n is right there, and the actual sum is right there, that difference right there is your r sub n. But then the next term was even bigger than that difference. So this is a sub n plus 1's magnitude. And that's bigger than the true distance between s sub n and the actual sum. So that next term is in, can be used as a threshold for the error. So when we look at Okay, so we know that this converges to natural log of 2. Somebody tell me what natural log of 2 is. Was it 1.09? It was 0.7-ish. Okay, so here's 1. When we add these two together, we get 1 half. Isn't 1 half within 1 half of 0.7? Right, 1 half is within 1 half of 0.7. Now we add 1 third. So we add a third to this, and whatever that's going to be, that's 3 over 6 plus 2 over 6, that's 5 over 6. So 5 over 6 is going to be within 1 fourth of 0.7. So let me say that, let's start over again. So here's the first partial sum, 1. That is within half of 0.7. Now we add these two together, we get to 1 half. That's within 1 third of 0.7. Then we add these three together, and that's going to be within one fourth of 0.7. Then we add the first four, that's going to be within one fifth of 0.7. Then we add the first five, that's going to be within one sixth of 0.7. Because the subsequent term takes us through the sum and beyond. So that next term is bigger than the true remainder. <coughs> so that next term can be used as a threshold on the remainder. So, so you're basically like changing the epsilon limit? You can think of it that way. This, the terms are going to zero, so the error is going to zero. Because it's the next term that is a measure of the error. Definitely you can think of it that way. That's a good way to think of it. So let's go ahead and we'll stop here so that we don't get too harassed. And then we'll do some examples of it on Thursday. Who knows whether campus is going to be open tomorrow or not? It doesn't feel that bad. Out. It was awful yeah. this morning. It was I slippery actually, this morning. Because I had to get here at 6.30. Yeah, it was slippery at that time of day.